This afternoon, I'm going to demonstrate for you some exception handling and the exception handling labs, which we're going to do at the end of this period and most of next period can be found by going to your Google Classroom. And you can see that there's a project there called exception handling projects. And there are these four labs that I'm going to ask you to do in the week, in the days ahead. And here is the link. So if you click on this link, it will take you to the Google directory where all the labs are for exception handling. Before lunch, we were saying that the reason that we need to learn how to do exception handling is that when you present an error like null pointer exception and show that to, say, an office worker who's not trained in software, that message doesn't really mean anything to them. They're not sure what they did wrong or what they should do next to fix the problem. And so what we want to do is we want to intercept these exceptions or unusual events, errors as you would call them, and provide for more descriptive messages, different behaviors that are under our control as to what to do when something goes wrong in a program. So we're going to look at some examples now. The other thing I want to mention is that we're going to be learning some vocabulary in this section. So if you look over here, these are all the keywords in Java. And now that you've completed your first year of programming, you know what a lot of these mean. In fact, I would say you know what most of them mean. But we're going to look at five additional words in this exceptional handling topic, which you don't know yet. These words are try, catch, try and catch go together. And then we also have throw and throws. And we also have finally. Those are the five words that we're going to study in this section. So I have those words listed right here. And by the time the exception handling unit is over, you should understand what all these words mean. Certainly the first four, I haven't decided if we're going to learn finally or not. We'll see how much time we have left. OK, we're going to start off by discussing try-catch. In order to understand try-catch, I have to draw a little analogy for you. And since the summer is about to start and baseball season is already started, I'm going to give you a baseball analogy. Here on the left-hand side, I have a pitcher. And here I have someone in the outfield who can catch the ball. We'll call them a catcher, even though catcher means something slightly different in baseball. Anyway, you can see in this picture, I have one pitcher and one catcher. The pitcher is going to throw the ball. The catcher is going to try to catch the ball. Now let's look at this scenario right here. You can see I have one pitcher, and there are several people out in the outfield waiting to catch the ball. This first one, where you have one pitcher and one catcher, is a perfectly fine scenario. And this picture here is also a perfectly fine scenario. The catcher doesn't know, the pitcher doesn't know who's going to catch the ball yet, but the pitcher's going to throw the ball, and one of them will catch it, hopefully. Now let's look at some other scenarios. Let's look at this scenario right here. Let's look at this scenario right here where we have a pitcher and we don't have a catcher. Good scenario or bad scenario? Bad scenario. This would result in a compiler error if you tried this on Java. I'll show you in a minute why. Likewise, if you have three catchers and no pitcher, good scenario or bad scenario? Bad scenario. No one to throw the ball. This would also result in a compiler error. So what that means is that in Java, as in life and baseball, you can have one pitcher and you can have as many catches as you want but you have to have at least one what does this have to do with java in java in java this is going to be the try keyword and these three represent the catch keywords so if we we're going to look at these keywords again the try that's when you throw the ball and catch that's when you catch the ball every time you have a try you have to have at least one catch you can have more than one catch, but you can't have a try without a catch. You can't have a catch without a try. What does that mean? We'll learn what that means in a few minutes. Now, what I've done is I have gone over to my labs here. And these are the labs that are linked in your Google Classroom. And I have downloaded the lab called Bad Projects. I'm going to walk through that now. And I would recommend that you download this project right now and follow along with me. So download this project, unzip the file, 
drag the folder to your desktop, and then you'll notice if there's no BlueJ package directory in there, you can open up BlueJ over here and say project open non BlueJ, and then click on the folder and it will start up the project as a BlueJ project and you should see these files in there. Let's look at the first demo here, which is demo number one, and let's look at the code. What's happening here is I'm clearing the screen and I'm in an infinite loop here where I am waiting to get a number and uh, I am ent I'm regurgitating or showing the number that was entered. To get the number, I'm calling this get number method. And here is the get number method. And you can see that it's using the scanner to read a number from the keyboard. So once again, to create a scanner, you go scanner, the name of the scanner, new scanner, and this system in is the way Java refers to the keyboard entry. So what I've done here is I've attached this scanner to the keyboard. Now I print a prompt telling the user what it kind of number I'm expecting. In this case, an integer between one and three. And then I'm gonna read the integer when the user enters it. And then I'm gonna return from this method and when I get back over here, I'm going to print the number that they entered. So let's try this now. I'm going to compile it. So you can see now the program is running and it's patiently waiting for me to enter number between one and three. So let's try it out. Let's try entering the number one. It's down here actually. One. And you can see it tells me I entered a one. Now let's try two. Here's two. Let's try three. What do you think will happen if I enter a four? Let's look at the code again. What do you think is going to happen if I enter a four? The instructions say to enter a number between one and three. Mr. Mene, sir, if I enter a four, what do you think will happen? Let's try it. It's still running. You can see the little Knight Rider eyes moving here. If I type a four, it doesn't know any better. It shows you the four and keeps going. So we see one problem already is that if they enter a number that's not in the range, we can't figure that out yet. We're going to add some code later to help us figure that out. But we have a much bigger problem that I want to discuss with you. Because you see sometimes when you ask the user to enter a number between one and three, they listen. Sometimes they don't listen. And sometimes they really don't listen, like they type in that. Now look what happened you can see that in this case, because they typed in junk that's not even a number, the Java runtime machine didn't know what to do, and so it gave you this error. This is the kind of error, the red ink is what we want to avoid. We don't want to show the red ink to the novice user who may not be familiar with programming. We want to take action on this, give a more descriptive error message, give them another chance to fix it. And if not, we want to take some other action, maybe load some number by default and move on. So I'm going to show you how to do that now in Java. So let's look over here at demo number two. And you can see the code is the same, except I've introduced this concept of a try catch. And the try catch basically says, try to do this. And if a problem happens, do that. So now the try has the curly brackets. Everything inside here is part of the try. And the catch has its own set of curly brackets. And everything inside here is part of the catch. In this first example, we have one try and one catch. Next time we're together, I'll show you more complicated examples where one try can have multiple catches. But right now, you'll just look at this one and you'll notice that I'm going to try to grab an integer, right, with this next int method, and something bad happens, like this input mismatch exception. Instead of showing red ink to the user, I'm going to display this message, and then I'm going to set some default number, which I've just decided I'm going to use if the user doesn't cooperate, and then I'm just going to return a 1. Notice that this program will continue to function and will not fail like it did in the other case where we had the red ink. So let's try this out now. And you can see it's waiting for me to enter a number. You notice that these numbers still continue to work. 
But now if I type in garbage here, you can see that instead of getting an error message, I get this message instead, which is more descriptive. I'm going to set the value to a one and display it because that's what I decided to do if the user didn't cooperate. It was under my control as a programmer. What am I going to do if they enter a bad number? And you can see it's continuing to work now. And it's back to its thing now. If I make another mistake like this, you'll see the error handling will kick in again. So you can see that this works much better now. So I'm going to turn the program off for a second. By the way, if you get into an infinite loop situation and you need to exit, you need to hit this little reset button down here, and that will stop the program from running. Let's look at the code again. So we see this is our first example of a try catch block. And you can see that the try is telling the computer, hey, I'm about to do something dangerous right now. So just be extra careful that an exception might get thrown. And here, this is the exception that I'm looking for. I'm asking for an integer, and they typed in something else. So what do I do? I can control what to do, and I can continue with my program thread. If I don't want to continue with my program thread, and I want to shut the program down, I could do something like this. This would be an error number, and this would basically stop the execution flow and end the program. I'm not going to do that in this case, but you could if you wanted to. If the error was serious enough and you didn't want to continue, you could do that. Let's look at one more example. So let's look at example number three. And in this case, we're not only going to handle the case where they type in garbage, that's not a number. But now we also want to handle the case where they entered a number, but it wasn't in the range we wanted. Like we asked them to enter a number between one and three, and maybe they typed a five. So in that case, we're going to throw the exception ourselves. See, here we're catching two types of exceptions. First, if they type in garbage, like they type in ABC, that will automatically create an input mismatch exception. But here, we're throwing an exception ourselves because even though they typed in a real number, it's not a number we were looking for. It wasn't in the right range. Now we have two different situations that can cause this input mismatch exception. This one here is we're manually throwing the exception. And to do that, we use the keyword throw. Notice that I use the keyword throw. I use the new, and then this is a method call. Talk to your partner about what kind of method am I calling here. Ms. Siegel, can you tell me what kind of method I'm calling here? It's a constructor. I'm calling a constructor for an exception class. So when I do new and then the method call here, I'm actually creating an exception object, and then I'm throwing that object. Throwing an exception basically means I'm triggering this catch block to run. So let's run this again now. And I want you to notice how different it is from example two. Look, if I type in a good number, see, it works fine. If I type in garbage, it does the same thing as before. But here's the new thing. If I type in a number like A, that's an integer, but it's not according to my instructions, you see I get the same error handling that I got for the regular junk. It's going to tell me that I did put in an invalid response and it's going to set the default value to a 1, and it's going to continue. So now you've learned two tricks. You've learned how to handle an exception that's caused by the user. You've also learned how to throw an exception yourself.